talk, um, let me maybe announce the last talk. So the last talk will be COA Secure Obfuscation and Applications by Rankanetti, Subbadev, Chakaboti, Dakshita Kurana, Nishant Kumar, Oksana uh, Puburi, Puburinaya, and Manoj Prapakaran. And uh, uh, before Suvaradip will, uh, uh, will tell us about this result, uh, uh, Ran Kanetti would like to uh, 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 speak a few words um, about the rec recent and tragic passing of uh, uh, one of the authors of this work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of our uh, co-authors, uh, Nishant Kumar, uh, uh, died last month in a tragic accident. And uh, I would like to say a few words in his memory, if, you know, with your permission. Um, uh, it's very short. So um, some of these words were, uh, were written by uh, Dakshita Karana, which is which was uh, Nishant advisor, and some of my own are my own. So um, so Nishant uh, was born December two, uh, nineteen ninety four, in Ranchi, Jakabard, India. And he passed away in a tragic accident uh, on April 10th uh, this year in Hawaii, Illinois, in the US. He was 27 years old. Um, so Nishant was a bright star in our lives. Uh, he was a special in his contagious, almost childlike enthusiasm and curiosity. He was also very insightful and smart. He had the, the, uh, the makings of a wonderful researcher and his passing is an immeasurable loss to our community. Even more importantly though, he was kind, patient, humble, and a caring mentor to many others. His uh, passion and curiosity extended to a very uh, wide array of topics spanning both theoretical and applied cryptography. He was beaming with questions and ideas and he loved long, deep technical conversations. Uh, he would uh, take it upon himself to drive project forward. He wouldn't shy away from spending long hours uh, thinking about hot questions. He was a dream student and a collaborator. He spent two productive years as a research fellow at Microsoft Research India, where he worked on multi-party computation compilers for machine learning. Uh, two of these papers titled uh, CryptFlow and CryptFlow2 had an important impact on the area of secure inference. At the UIUC, he worked on uh, uh, non malleable and verifiable uh, obfuscation, which is the work that we will talk about today, and on new ways to achieve security by exploiting the properties of quantum information, which is forthcoming work. In our joint work, uh, he was first uh, very tentative but uh, as he learned more about the work and the relevant literature, he became more confident and started uh, uh, catching us uh, when we were uh, uh, saying something wrong uh, uh, or just uh, BSing. Uh, uh, soon enough, he started owning the work and rewriting uh, uh, large parts of it. Uh, throughout, I was very much impressed uh, uh, with uh, Nishant uh, uh, insight insightfulness, and uh, uh, and his ability to say that he does not understand, but he didn't, he does, did he not understand, or does know something. But when he was saying something for sure, it, he was invariably right. Um, last uh, some in last month uh, uh, in March, we were working on uh, finally putting a full version of the paper on ePrint. Um, I was uh, 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 writing a new proof for one of the uh, the theorems. And uh, uh, I was uh, very proud of it. It was very nice, uh, I thought, the nice ideas. And uh, I, uh, it looked just fine, but I sent everybody, please say, can you take a look? Uh, and uh, and the, uh, then the following weekly meeting uh, uh, that Monday, uh, uh, Nishan said, you know, it's very nice, but there are two issues which I don't really understand. And uh, I knew I was in trouble, and, and sure enough, you know, those two issues were <laughs> were, were deep flaws in this in this uh, in this proof, which we spent uh, a lot of time, well, the the entire uh, meeting to discuss. Uh, then uh, time ran out, and uh, um, and uh, and we had to you know stop. We said we'll talk uh, the next week, 
spent uh, I spent most of the week uh, thinking about uh, ways to get around those issues, and I was looking forward to the next Monday's meeting to uh, 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 to discuss it again with Nishant and the others. But then Monday morning, I opened my email to the terrible news. So, um, so I would like to, uh, to tell Nishant, wherever he is, that we now think we have it done, and uh, it's in the same uh, overleaf. If you can take a look, it would be great. Um, let me just uh, 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 say um, a few, uh, the one last paragraph, saying that Nishant's uh, beautiful smile, sincerity, energy, and cheer, and, and, and cheer touch the lives of everyone around him. He's, uh, it is still very hard to accept that he will never come back to us, uh, uh, but we always keep his, the memories of, in our hearts and use his life to guide our own when we move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Ran, for the obituary. Um, indeed, it's very hard to accept that Nishant is not with us anymore, and I would like to dedicate my talk in the memory of Nishant. Okay, so uh, so this talk is about COA secure obfuscation and applications. Um, this is joint work with Ran, Dakshita, Nishant, Oksana, and Manoj. So uh, a one minute summary of the paper. So this paper provides a framework that endows software obfuscation with proofs of well-formedness. So in particular, this, uh, it enhances many of the existing security notions for of obfuscation to provide uh, verifiability and non-malleability guarantees. And we show generic construction satisfying our definitions. So the roadmap will be, I'll start with some motivations why we consider such a notion, followed by our new definitions and some new applications to complete CCA encryption and uh, stronger software watermarking. So in the interest of time, uh, in this talk, I'll be talking about the complete CCA encryption, although the software watermarking is also one of the main applications of our paper. And I would, I, I would encourage people to look up our paper for the watermarking application. And finally, I would end my talk with um, the construction of COA obfuscation. Good. So general purpose software obfuscation holds great promise for enhancing the security of software. In general, uh, softwares can be distributed and executed without fear that the internal design secrets of the program or the keys that are hidden inside the code will be revealed. And this is great for software creators because they can use obfuscation to hide the um, keys uh, both in the code and functionality. However, ubiquitous use of obfuscation might also call for some drawbacks. In particular, it's hard to verify properties of the obfuscated program. Um, in general, it reduces to black box testing the program. And this is, of, um, and this is highly unsatisfactory particularly if the, of, uh, for example, the creator of the obfuscated program is untrusted or unknown. So yet another pressing issue is the issue of malleability in which the adversary might create an obfuscated program that depends on the secrets that are embedded in some other obfuscated program in illegitimate ways. And when I say illegitimate, it could refer to the legitimacy condition could refer to both the structural and functional properties of the, of, of the uh, obfuscated program. So for example, obfuscation might help to facilitate software plagiarism. 
Imagine that I publish an office credit program A that hides the details that it's potentially using the mold version of some proprietary software, uh, and it's not public, publicly announcing it, right? Um, and, and this is a problem even if the, uh, the program B is implemented correctly, because the behavior of A might depend in malicious way depending upon the behavior of B. So one might expect that the already existing notions of software obfuscation, um, like IO, give some sort of non-malleability guarantee. Um, and in particular, this is somewhat true. If, for example, IO uses inside it some module that directly does not affect the functionality of, of, of the program. But for example, imagine that you're obfuscating a pseudorandom function, like a puncturable PRF with a key K, so that directly affects the output of the program. So in such case, it might be possible that adversary takes such an obfuscated program and produces another program that com computes the same function, but on a related key, say key K plus one, for example. Right, so hopefully this provides enough motivation why we should study verifiability and non-malleability for obfuscation in general. So um, having said that, let's see what are the challenges that arise when we try to define such a notion of obfuscation. So, um, so since we're talking about some sort of verifiability or non-malleability, we should have a verifier um, that takes an obfuscated program and outputs, say, accept or reject. Okay. So let's uh, try to define um, in the following way, that when the verifier accepts a program, then a specific circuit is being obfuscated. Of course, this is not desirable because ideally you would like to hide the code of C, which ideally obfuscation should do. But if we prove that a specific circuit is being obfuscated, then you reveal all the details of the circuit. The second attempt is that you would want to say that, okay, so if the verifier accepts, there exists some circuit C, which is functionally equivalent to this obfuscated circuit. This sounds reasonable. However, this is trivial to achieve because for every obfuscated program, there exists some plain text program corresponding to it. So let's define a class of predicate. For the simplicity, let's consider a particular public predicate phi. And now the verification algorithm also takes as input some predicate and um, outputs accept. Uh, so we would want to say that if the output of the verification on input and obfuscated circuit and a public predicate is accept, then there exists an underlying circuit which is functionally equivalent to the obfuscated circuit and satisfies the predicate. Now look that what we can do is that we can define the predicate in a fine-tuned way that hides the code of the circuit C yet att attests to some of the properties that you'd want to um, Verify. So, for example, it might attest that the program is of some particular functionality or of some particular structure, um, whatever you would want. Okay, so what's the trivial way to achieve this? Uh, you obfuscate a program and attach an ESIC proof that there exists some circuit C and randomness that results in the obfuscated circuit and satisfies the predicate, right? Um, the drawback is that it requires a, tr uh, a trusted uh, setup phase that is a common reference string. Um, and the goal of this work is to construct verifiable and non-malleable obfuscation in the plane model. Good. So uh, before going into the details, let's review some prior works. So um, to the best of our knowledge, the closest uh, work that is related to this topic is the notion of, is, is, is the verifiable functional encryption by um, Badrinara and Goel, Jain and Sahai from Asia Group 16. Um, so the upside of their construction is that they provide a construction for IO that's verifiable and does not require any trusted setup assumption. However, the drawback is that their technique is tailor-made for IO. So the, their idea is to use NIMI instead of NISIX uh, however, if you think about it, if, if you use NIMI, then the NIMI only guarantees that the witness is hidden if you have some alternate witnesses. So if you just obfuscate a program, you don't have an alternate witness to prove. So what they do in their construction is basically obfuscate uh, the same program, say, three times, and then prove using NIMI that two of the programs are uh, same or functionally equivalent. And now I can use NIMI in... Um, in some way to, uh, to give verifiability. Um, 
and I, I think the main drawback of their work, you said, it provides a limited form of hiding. That is the require, that is the can only guarantee indistinguishability for um, indistinguishability for obfuscations of functional equivalent circuit for which there exists only a short proof of equivalence. Say, if you obfuscate, for example, a PRF and a punctured PRF, you have such a short proof of equivalence, but in general, this is not true for um, in general circuits. And also, it does not provide any sort of guarantee against malleability attacks. So it only provides guarantee against verifiability. Okay, so there's another work by um, Ran and Mayank from TCC 2009 um, in the, uh, with the title on malleable obfuscation. Uh, and th this gives, um, um, however, this considers obfuscation for point functions and related functionalities because this is a simulation-based definition. And um, as we know that for all class of functions, you cannot get VVB obfuscation. So this paper considers uh, obfuscation for uh, um, uh, point functions and multi-point functions. Okay? But if you think about it, uh, to define non-malleability, it's natural that you would want to have a simula simulation-based definition that whatever the adversary could come up with a black box axis, you can also simulate. Unfortunately, it's plagued by impossibility result. So this brings us to the, uh, our definition, what is uh, COA stands for chosen obfuscation attacks. So um, as before, let's consider a class of circuits and some predicate phi. And you'd expect that, um, so, the obfusc the, so the obfuscation algorithm also takes some circuit C and a predicate phi and outputs um, the program um, C hat. And the verification algorithm also takes the, predicate phi and it should output one or zero. However, it turns out that, uh, uh, so the so obfuscator can be randomized and the verifier is deterministic, right? So in this setting, it turns out that uh, it's very difficult to achieve uh, security, uh, I mean, even verifiability for a general class of circuits. So what we do is relax the notion and say that the verifier can also be randomized. And the output of the verifier is not a single bit, instead it's a circuit. So let's try to understand this notion. So it's a so the obfuscation is basically a two-step process, where uh, the obfuscator takes as input some circuit C and outputs um, some semi-functional obfuscation. Like it's not yet a fully functional program, so think of it as an um, encoding, and the verifier then transforms this encoding into a fully functional obfusc obfuscated circuit. So what is the correctness guarantee? The correctness guarantee is that for a legitimate circuit, that is a circuit which satisfies the predicate, the output of the verifier is functionally equivalent to the circuit that you obfuscated. Soundness says that for any arbitrary um, program, intermediate program, C hat, if the output of the verifier is not bottom, that is, uh, it's, a, uh, it's some circuit C tilde, which is not bottom, then there exists an underlying circuit which is functionally equivalent to C and satisfies the predicate. So, which means, so this means that if the verifier outputs some circuit, then there, there exists some, uh, some explanation of the circuit in the plain text space and, uh, su and such that the plain text program is legitimate. And finally, I come to the main notion, which is COA security which says that for sufficiently similar circuits C0 and C1, the obfuscation of these two circuits is indistinguishable, even given access to a de-obfuscation oracle. So I'll make it more explicit in the next slide. So um, let's consider this game between a challenger and an adversary. So the adversary um, uses a sampler to sample um, uh, circuit C0, C1, along with some auxiliary input Z and passes it to the challenger. Now, when I say that the circuits must be sufficiently similar, so what do I mean by that is that the sampler should be admissible. So in some sense, the, the circuit C0 and C1 should satisfy the predicate and they should be indistinguishable by black box access. Okay? So note that this is powerful enough to capture um, any notion of obfuscation that provides some sort of hiding guarantees. Like in case of IO, C0 and C1 are functionally equivalent and Z is just null, or you can think of Z as C0, C1. You can also capture PIO, XIO in this notion where um, um, you can define the sampler accordingly. Okay. Now, uh, 
the challenger sam uh, samples a random bit and obfuscates the circuit CB and sends uh, C hat. So note that C hat is still not the fully functional program, right? It's the intermediate program. Now, uh, the adversary can ask for deobfuscation queries. So it gives us input to the challenger some string C hat, which is a semi functional program. And what the challenger does is that if it is equal to the challenge intermediate program, it outputs, it outputs bottom, else it runs the randomized verifier to transform it into a fully functional obfuscated circuit, C tilde. And if C tilde is not bottom, um, it returns, um, uh, it, it returns, um, so there is a typo here. So basically you can think of it that when C tilde is not bottom, it returns a lexicographically first circuit which is functionally equivalent to um, C and satisfies the predicate. Okay. So this is how the deobfuscation oracle is defined. So note that um, this holds because if the output of the verifier is not bottom, then as I said, then there exists an underlying plain text circuit uh, which satisfies the predicate. And in particular, there can be many such circuits. So the um, challenger, is inefficient, of course, and it outputs the lexicographically first such circuit which satisfies the predicate. Okay. And it returns the plain text circuit to the adversary. And the deobfuscation circuits can, uh, queries can be made adaptively and in arbitrary order. Um, and for simplicity, I've assumed that the adversary in the first step gives the C0, C1, but this is not necessary. It can also ask deobfuscation queries and then uh, give the challenge. Um, and finally, it uh, outputs a bit B prime that um, that's a guess for which of the circuits was obfuscated. Okay, so in our work, we also provide a second definition that is more handy to work with. So in particular, this definition says that you give me any, any notion of obfuscation that satisfies some hiding guarantee, which is represented by the admissible sampler definition. And I can augment this obfuscated circuit to give you a COA guarantee on top of it. So we call it COA fortification. So um, as before, we consider a class of circuit and a predicate phi. But now let's define O to be an obfuscation scheme, which is injective. So why do I need it to be injective? I'll later explain. But in general, you can um, transform any obfuscation scheme into an injective obfuscation scheme by attaching a perfectly binding commitment of the plain text program along with the obfuscated circuit. Okay, so as before, uh, the, obfus the obfuscator takes as input the circuit and the predicate outputs a semi-functional program, which is then transformed by the randomized verifier into a fully functional program, C tilde. So the correctness is that uh, for a legitimate circuit, um, the output of the verifier should be in the image of the obfuscator O. So in particular, C tilde can be explained as an obfuscator of C with some randomness R. Soundness says that if the output of the verifier on some arbitrary, arbitrary string C hat is not bottom, then there exists an underlying circuit C such that it satisfies the predicate and is in the image of the obfuscation O. And finally, COA security says that, again, for sufficiently similar circuits C0 and C1, given access to a deobfuscation oracle O inverse. So this is where it, it becomes important why the obfuscation scheme is injective. So when I say an obfuscation scheme is injective, it means that no two, pro, no two plain text programs map to the same obfuscated program. So for each obfuscated circuit, there is a uniquely defined plain text program, and hence the challenger can inefficiently invert and recover the plain text program. Okay? So now uh, the security says that if the obfuscation of the two circuits, C0 and C1, are indistinguishable, I can use this distinguisher to build a distinguisher for the underlying obfuscator row. Okay? So uh, pictorially, so this is the, it says that, um, suppose in this world where, in the left world where there is an adversary and challenger and um, it runs this game uh, where the adversary, where it, the adversary rece receives um, a challenge semi-functional program, which is an obfuscation of either C0 or C1. And it makes deobfuscation queries arbitrary and adaptively. And suppose there is a distinguisher uh, so if the adversary can distinguish which of the two circuits uh, was obfuscated with um, non-negligible advantage, 
then I can use this uh, adversary to build an adversary in the right 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 hand world where note that there are no deobfuscation queries. So this translates to an uh, a distinguisher for the underlying obfuscator O. Okay. Good. And um, it's not hard to see that this definition two for injective PIO implies our definition one. So if you have COA fortification for injective PIO for some class of samplers, so more technically XINT PIO, this implies our definition in the, um, the, the definition that I earlier uh, showed you. Okay, so let's jump into the application um, given the definitions. So uh, the application that uh, I'll be talking about is a complete CCA public key encryption. So, um, so this is basically an enhancement of CCA secure public key encryption where the adversary has access to a strong decryption oracle. So uh, normally in CCA, the adversary has access to a decryption oracle where it can feed different cipher text and get messages, but with respect to the challenge public key. But here the adversary can submit uh, a tuple of public keys and cipher text of his or her choice and get, um, and get it decrypted. So this is, this is a strengthening of the notion of completely non-malleable encryption, which was uh, defined by Fishlin and uh, le some later uh, works uh, when defined appropriately. So it turns out that this notion is too good to be achievable in the plain model. So Fishlin uh, showed that completely non-malleable public key encryption is impossible to construct in the plain model if you are using black box reduction and um, if the assumption in your hand is a polynomial time falsifiable assumption. Okay. So in our work, we bypass this impossibility result by uh, using sub-exponential hardness assumptions. Okay. So before going into the model, we require one technical um, condition from the public key encryption, namely unique decryptability. So what does it say? Um, so for any public key, there is a way to test whether this public key is useless. So I assume that the encryption algorithm can output a string bottom and the decryption algorithm on input such as ciphertext, which is bottom outputs bottom. So I say a public key is useless when the probability that the, for any message, uh, the ciphertext is bottom is some negligible. Okay. And for um, non-useless keys, there should be a unique opening for this public key. So that means there should be a secret key that decrypts the cipher text correctly. And moreover, for this unique opening, there should exist a, um, uh, a public key that is under the um, support of the key generation algorithm. So note that the public key PK might not be in the uh, support of key generation. So pictorially, uh, the challenger runs the key generation and um, gives the public key, the challenge public key to the adversary. Now the adversary can ask for um, uh, like tuples of his choice, like PKI, CI. Now the challenger checks if PKI is useless. If it is not useless, it inefficiently uh, finds the opening, that is the secret key, and returns the message MI, which is the result of decrypting um, CI under the opening. Okay. And it can do it uh, arbitrarily and as many times as it wants. And then it, uh, the adversary gives two messages M0, M1, and gets the encryption of one of them. And it can continue the um, strong decryption oracle phase. And at some point, it uh, outputs a guess for the bit B. Okay. So uh, having defined this notion, let's see how to construct this strong form of uh, public encryption. So for this, we would of course be requiring our notion of COA fortification for an injective IO. So with respect to a predicate, which says that the predicate attests to some program, which I will shortly show. So we need a zero random generator, which is length doubling and two uh, PRFs, which is puncturable. So the key generation algorithm samples two keys and the public key is an obfuscation of the following circuit. So it has two PRF keys embedded inside it. It takes as input a message and a randomness and expands the randomness and uh, uses the C1 uh, to basically um, 
um, a encrypt the messages like a one-time pad. And C3 is basically, you can think of it as like a Mac on C1 and C2. So this is basically the Sahai Waters CC secure public key encryption. And uh, what we do is kind of replace the obfuscation with the COA fortification for injective IO. So the encryption algorithm, so note that the public key is not yet a fully functional obfuscated circuit. So it's the P hat is the semi-functional program. So the encryption algorithm runs the verification, transforms it into a fully functional program, and then runs the uh, program on input the message and some randomness that it samples. Okay. And the output is basically the ciphertext from the obfuscated circuit. And the decryption uh, key is basically the two secret keys and um, the decryption is trivial. Okay. So why is the scheme uniquely decryptable? So it follows from the soundness of um, the COA fortification of, of IO and the injectivity of IO. So, this is because if the encryption algorithm outputs um, some uh, some circuit P tilde, um, which is not bottom, which, that means that there exists some plain text program such that um, that program can uh, that program is the obfuscation of so, so such that P tilde is the obfuscation of that program. And since we say that the program should attest to this predicate phi, um, uh, which is this program PK1, K2, it means the plain text program must have this structure. So in particular, I can uh, extract the keys K1, K2 and uh, use it for decryption. And since the uh, IO is injective, there exists a unique such plain text program. Okay. okay. Um, right, so let's go to, uh, let's see the proof of this on a very high level. Uh, so recall this, this is the program that we are obfuscating. So, so broadly, the two cases might, might arise for each strong decryption query. First, um, the public key PKI that the adversary queries is equal to the challenge public key. This is an easy case because then we are basically reducing to the CCA security of Sahai waters because the challenge key is not being changed. The interesting case is when the public key is changed. So the adversary queries on some PKC where PK is not equal to PK star. So in this case, you, uh, you interpret PK as some semi-functional program. You run the verifier and get a fully functional circuit, uh, P tilde. And, you and by the soundness of COA fortification, you know that there exists a plain text program, which is obfuscated by um, IO to get P tilde. So now you recover uh, this plain text program by using the deobfuscation oracle. And um, since the secret keys of the form, uh, so, so once you have the plain text program, you can read the code of the program to recover the underlying PRF keys and use it for decryption. Good. Okay, so um, finally, I'll go to the construction of uh, COA obfuscation very briefly. For this, we need a non-interactive distributionally indistinguishable argument That's, that was introduced by uh, Dakshita from last year Eurocrypt. So what is a needy argument? A needy argument is defined with respect to an NP language uh, with some relation RL, such that um, the prover and the verifier has input the language L. The prover in addition has some secret distribution D, of, uh, which it can use to sample statements and witnesses from the distribution in effici efficiently. The prover hands over to the verifier uh, one message, think of it as a sampler, and the verifier can use the sampler and its randomness to verifiably sample members from the distribution. So, so in particular, completeness says that the output of the verifier is in the support of the distribution um, on the statement. Soundness says that if uh, the output of the verifier is not bottom, that means that D is in the NP language L. So think of it as the instance being in the language. And privacy says that for um, distributions which are indistinguishable, the proof does not break the indistinguishability. Okay. So for every distribution D1 and D2, um, uh, which are indistinguishable, the samplers which are output by the prover are also indistinguishable. Okay, and uh, this paper shows that assuming sub-exponential IO and one-way function that exists needy for all of NP. So in our work, we need a robust version of needy, which we introduce, um, which is a needy, um, that guarantees similar indistinguishability, but with respect to an Oracle O. So as before, um, 
uh, we have the prover and the verifier and the completeness and the soundness guarantee, but robustness in general says that the two distribution, if the two distributions are indistinguishable, uh, maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, then the output of the prover is also indistinguishable, even if the distinguisher get access to this Oracle O. Okay. And we show how to construct this robust needy uh, by uh, modifying the construction from the paper last year, um, but I don't go into the details. So for the construction, I need a CCA secure commitment scheme uh, where the Oracle O is basically the decommitment Oracle. And I need an obfuscation scheme that is, um, um, that is secure against um, adversaries that can internally store this Oracle. Okay? And the obfuscation scheme is very simple. So the distribution is defined as follows. You obfuscate the circuit C with some randomness R1 and you commit to the plain text program. Okay? So having defined this distribution, the uh, proof is basically, uh, so the obfuscation algorithm is basically the sampler of the needy prover. And the verification algorithm is just verifying the needy proof. Okay? Um, and I won't go into the proof, uh, but the high level idea is that in, uh, in, in the first hybrid, I um, obfuscate C0 and commit to C0. And now I uh, deobfuscate de using the decommitment Oracle. So note that um, in the first game, the deobfuscation was done using O inverse, but now um, I will deobfuscate using the decommitment Oracle inefficiently. And in the next hybrid, I will switch to obfuscating and committing to the other program C1, which I can show to be indistinguishable based on another hybrid argument. And roughly, uh, since we assume that all the underlying primitives are secure with respect to the decommitment Oracle, in particular with respect to adversaries who can store the decommitment Oracle, um, the proof goes through. Okay, so finally, uh, I would uh, conclude with some open problems. Um, so note that the main drawback is that our definition relies on this two-step randomized process. Is it possible to construct CO secure obfuscation for the more traditional definition where the verifier is deterministic? And secondly, can we come up with more applications of CO obfuscation? Um, because this seems to be, um, this seems that it will find more applications in other areas of cryptography. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and I'm open to taking questions. Right. Thank you, Subhadeep. We have time for maybe one quick question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so in all of, most of your notions, the uh, challenger is inefficient, right? I was wondering whether this leads to uh, problems with you know, the final hybrid proofs and reduction. Uh, so yeah, good question. So it does not, because we assume that the underlying primitives basically are also secure with respect to, so are sub-exponentially secure. So for example, in the construction, last construction that I showed, the, the deobfuscation oracle is basically inefficiently opening the commitment. So it's the decommitment oracle. So if you assume, so suppose um, that oracle you, uh, like is of size some capital T, because it's a finite truth table, you can write it down. And if you assume that the underlying other primitives are secure with respect to adversaries that run in that time, then uh, then it's possible to uh, argue security. So yes, uh, we need uh, secu security of all the underlying primitives um, to set. I mean, to satisfy some exponential hardness. So yeah, that's how we kind of cope with the inefficiency of the challenger. Okay, so. Uh, this would conclude this session. I would say let's thank all the speakers again. See you after lunch break.